Mark 1, 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Give us a little context on the focal point of your passage as it fits into Mark's gospel. Well, it's an awesome passage because it represents Jesus's first message ever, which is really cool because, you know, we, we've introduced John the Baptist, you know, as his forerunner, and then Jesus goes through his baptism temptation, and then here he comes out and he says his very first words, his very first message, and that's what makes it special. The first thing he says is the time is fulfilled. You know, the kingdom of God is at hand. So the time is fulfilled kind of shows that it is time for something very special to happen that God has been preparing for for a long time. So that's that's really important. And then the second thing is the kingdom of God, which becomes kind of a theme for almost everything that Jesus does from that point on, from miracles to messages to prayers, everything else. So it's, it's really significant for us. It's kind of like God calling us home. You know, it was awesome because the Bible tells us we were separated from God. You know, there's division, there's there's sickness, there's death, all the things that sin brought into the world. And God had a plan to make it right. And so when Jesus comes and says the kingdom of God is at hand, he was basically saying it is once again possible to step back under the leadership of God, your king, and to live in relationship with him. And then his ministry kind of demonstrated all the things that would happen because of that. Sickness was dealt with, evil was dealt with, you know, a new way of loving, being close to the Father. Everything else kind of flows out of that, that concept of being again in God's kingdom. It represents who we are. You know, when our identity now is kingdom citizens. Uh, yes, we're here on earth. Yes, we're here in our country or our community. But ultimately, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. So we live by kingdom values. We have kingdom mission. You know, we, we live by kingdom purposes. So it, it kind of defines who we are. Now we become, I think Paul mentioned it in the New Testament, we become ambassadors. Uh, you know, we're citizens of heaven, but we're still here on earth. And so we become ambassadors preaching a message that anybody, no matter who you are, is loved by God and can be back in relationship with him by trusting Jesus Christ, admitting your need and trusting him. We become ambassadors of that message and we become representatives of heaven, like how we live reflects on God and, and who he is. And so how we love, how we care, how we deal with justice, all of those things reflect on God and show people what God's kingdom truly is like. So God calls us to be in, but not of the world. You know, so I think Jesus said, you know, we are salt and light. And so he wanted us to let our light, our love, our care, our compassion to show in such a way that it would draw glory to God. And so uh, we live in a fallen world uh, and we are still imperfect ourselves, you know, struggling along. But because we know the Lord and we have the Spirit in us, uh, we have an opportunity to bring heaven wherever we go, to bring that kingdom of God. So anytime we love the way Jesus loves, they get a little glimpse of Jesus, a little glimpse of what it's like to be in the kingdom. Hello, my name is Brett Berger. I'm with the College of Theology, and I am here with Craig St. John from the College of Business. Thank you for being with us today. And what do you do here? So I teach in the Department of Management within CCOB, as you referred mm -hmm. to, specifically teaching organizational behavior and management. So as we're talking about this intersection of faith, learning, and work, management's a little bit more of a natural fit than mm -hmm. things like accounting. Yeah, so uh, I guess we'll dig into a little bit of that today. So you've been doing a little bit of reflection on this passage from yeah. Mark 1 and the calling of the disciples. What were one or two things that stood out to you? The section I focused on was 14 through 20, but backing up to 9 a little bit, you see where Jesus is in Nazareth in, in Galilee, which is his boyhood home. 
And so that kind of the theme that we're drawing out within this is coming home. What he's first doing is starting to invite others to come into this home. He's inviting people into his home, showing hospitality. He's showing what it takes to get into that home, which is a few commands he gives us, which are to repent, believe. And then as he goes and finds these fishers, he says, follow me. And immediately, Mark loves to use this word immediately over and over again, they start yeah. following. So I, I think just that idea of kind of paralleling, juxtaposing home, what's not home, seeing heaven coming to earth, and you see home coming to earth. And this is the place where we'll all dwell eternally with the Son of God, with Christ, the second member of the Trinity. So now when you think about your world, the management and the things that you teach and all of that sort of stuff, what are maybe ways in which these principles flesh themselves out. Yeah, you know, there's not much room for Trinitarian discussion in organizational behavior and management, <laughs> as one might suspect. What we talk about a lot is contrasting things like management and leadership, which I'll probably mention in a second here. But we look at leadership, we look at followership, following be a key aspect within this passage. We look at things like having a mission, having a vision. So these are things we talk about in an organizational setting. Um, the terminology we use, mission versus vision. We all read those things on companies' websites. Mission is kind of your purpose for existing. Jesus' mission here and now in the first century was to start proclaiming the word, to start proclaiming the gospel, to getting the good news out and to finding a following to do that with him. That was his mission. But it pointed to something more, a vision. The theological terms you probably use would be like telos or culmination of seeing this home coming to earth and inviting people into it to dwell in perfect bliss for all eternity. So that is the vision. That's, yeah. that's the mission's a part of that, but it's not, that's not to an end. One day we won't need to evangelize. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we look forward to that heavenly dwelling coming here to coming home, but home, not us going away to home, home coming to us. Yeah. We look at that aspect, mission and vision, of course. And then I do contrast between management and leadership. Uh, management is positional. You can have a position of management. doesn't mean you're a leader. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go too far back into history books <laughs> And present day to see people in positions of power and authority who we wouldn't necessarily want to call leaders, at least in the way that we identify it in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We see this in Matthew, where the mother of the sons of Zebedee, of James and John, ironically, if you will, two of the first people being called is trying to fight, if you will, to get that positional authority of power and prestige in what's supposed to be a very selfless kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And... Jesus says, no, if you want to be first, you have to be last. Yeah. You have to be the suffering servant of which Isaiah prophesied. And that's, that's what servanthood looks like. Many people aspiring to fame and prestige and position and authority are not doing that. We do speak a lot about servant leadership as that being exactly the pinnacle of what we should look like. And yeah. that's not a position of being a doormat or weakness. That's strength in the mm. utmost strong ways. Yeah. You're not worried about the facade and the things that come with that. So we draw those things into it. Yeah, sure. yeah. So and now thinking about the classroom and the students, how do you push them to kind of reflect on some of these things? Do you have a few, one or two things that you like to do in the classroom? Yeah, it's kind of hitting on those kind of main things I mentioned, at least within this passage, just stick to that. It is looking at mission. It's looking at vision. It's contrasting leaders and followers, the aspect that you can't have leadership without followership. Um, you can say you're a leader, but if nobody's following you, you ain't a leader. <laughs> so um, we, we do see that indeed. And what we don't see in this passage is, we, we know it looking back in history, but we don't see it was compelling or captivating about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I think it was his character. It was who he was. It was um, the something that, I mean, it was probably a Holy Spirit moment. We do talk about leadership a lot in the classroom as being inspiration, as being influence, mm -hmm. as being motivating, as being a role model of having character, of practicing what you preach. And of course, we see that in the person of work in Jesus. So we're trying to bring that authenticity into our students' lives. So they're not yeah. going forth and getting management majors just to be a boss, which yeah. frankly might be a lot of them. <laughs> that, that sounds great to us when we're in high school, right. picking our uh, college major, like, sure, I'll be a boss. Yeah. But we teach that's not what it is. It's yeah. so much more than that. Well, I really appreciate you taking some time out today to share some of these ideas and uh, good luck with the, this coming semester and everything that you are doing in the classroom as Thanks, well. Thanks, so. Nice speaking with you. Appreciate it.